On behalf of the people of Tennessee that I represent, and I think the American people as well, I want to thank the senator from Iowa for his leadership on these two bills, but particularly on the compounding pharmacy bill. Our differences of opinion in the United States Senate are well advertised on Obamacare, on debt, on Syria, on a whole variety of matters. In fact, you would say that the reason we exist is to debate the big issues that haven't been resolved somewhere else. But there's another aspect of the Senate that is rarely as well advertised, and that's when we get a result. And sometimes the results take a long time, involve a lot of people, and are very difficult to, to, to get to. And that is the case with these two bills. And had not uh, Senator Harkin been patient and as well as aggressive at the same time in working with Republicans and Democrats and with members of the House, we would not have gotten till today. I think it's important to call to the attention of the American people this result, because these two pieces of legislation, one which makes it clear who's in charge, as Senator Harkin said, Who's on the flagpole when it comes to making sure that the sterile drugs that are injected into your back when you have back pain are safe so that you don't end up with a horrible death from fungal meningitis? Who's responsible for that? And then the second bill is, how are we going to make sure that the four billion prescriptions that we have every year in this country are safe, that they're not stolen, that they do what they are supposed to do? How are we gonna make sure that we can track them from the manufacturer all the way through to the person who uses them? We've been working on these bills for two years. And lest anyone think that because it was a voice vote in the House and because we're close to unanimous consent in the Senate that it was easy to do, it's not that easy to do. In fact, it's worth going through how this happened. Before I say just a word to add to what the Senator said about the importance of the bills. The FDA became involved in the fungal meningitis issue in February of 2012, a year ago, after reports from Tennessee that fungal meningitis was, was tied to a sterile compounded drug. Now this hits home to, to many Americans because a great many Americans have been injected in their neck or in their back or in their foot with a drug that's supposed to be sterile. And if it's not, it can have terrible consequences. Immediately, Senator Harkin called a hearing. It was November 15, a year ago, that, so, that, that we had our first hearing. And then within six months, we relief, released draft legislation to address the compounding pharmacy issue. Uh, we then had a hearing on that legislation. Then we passed the legislation after a lot of comment, all in the open. Everyone had a chance to weigh in. We passed it unanimously. Now this committee on which we serve, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, probably ref reflects the widest span of ideological differences we have in the United States Senate. Uh, the Republicans can be very conservative and the Democrats can be very progressive or very liberal. So you would think it would be hard to get a unanimous agreement, but we did. We sent it to the House unanimously. Then the House went to work on it, and they came up with their own version of the bill, taking our work into account. They passed it by a voice vote and sent it back. And so here, here we are today, uh, Mr. President, with a piece of legislation that has been hotlined. That means that both sides have sent it around to every single office. And all but one senator has agreed that we can pass it by unanimous consent. Now, the senator has that right has that right. And just as I have that right, or the senator from West Virginia, or the senator from Iowa has that right, and sometimes we exercise that right. But later this afternoon, we're going to be having a cloture vote, a vote to move to this bill. And that cloture vote is going to succeed. There will be sufficient number of Republican votes and a sufficient number of Democrat votes to say, we're ready to deal with this. And why are we ready to deal with this? because Commissioner Hamburg of the Food and Drug Administration told us at our hearing what would happen if we don't. She said this, quote, we have a collective opportunity and responsibility to help prevent further tragedies. If we fail to act, the FDA commissioner said, this type of incident will happen again. It is a matter of when, not if, I'm afraid. If we fail to act now, she told us, 
It will only be a matter of time until we're all back in this room asking why more people have died and what could have been done to prevent it. Now, no one is saying that this legislation is going to guarantee that there will never, ever be a tragedy again, but it will help prevent future tragedies. It will take up the responsibility that she challenged us to do. And now that we've spent two years on, a year on it, and so many people have been involved, it's time that we move to do it. So my hope is that after the cloture vote tonight, that very soon thereafter, after everyone's had a chance to speak and to say what they have to say, that we can pass this by unanimous consent, send it to the president and say to the American people that our differences are well advertised, but that our results can be equally important and that we can pass a piece of legislation which when taken with the track and trace legislation which accompanies it, affects the health and safety of every single American, period. Every single American. I know the people of Tennessee would welcome a prompt solution to this, and that's what I hope we have. Senator Harkin, as he often does, spoke in very personal terms about this legislation. Let me just tell one story from Tennessee so that we can know what we're talking about here. Diana Reed, 56, Tennessee. She had tried massage and acupuncture but neither eased her neck pain. One of the potential causes for her pain was an injury sustained while helping her husband, who had Lou Gehrig's disease, in and out of the wheelchair. Diana Reed was healthy, either ran or swam every day in addition to becoming Wayne's arms and legs and voice, according to her brother, Bob. She, tried, she decided to try a series of epidural steroid injections for her neck problem and one of them before her health insurance ran out after losing her job at a nonprofit group. This decision ended her life on October 3rd of last year. She began receiving injections on August 21 with a total of three scheduled, one every two weeks. She felt pain and nausea for a full day after the first two injections. After the third, she began having headaches. September 23, she finally agreed to go to a doctor. She was quickly diagnosed with meningitis. While she remained stable for a few days and was mostly concerned about her husband's well-being, now remember, he has Lou Gehrig's disease, and getting home to him as soon as possible, she took a turn for the worse. Her speech began to slur, she had trouble seeing, and eventually she had a stroke. A day later, she was in a coma. A thousand people packed Otter Creek Church for her funeral, among them the alumni of a child care learning center for inner city preschooler that she and her husband had founded. The autopsy found fungal meningitis at the ejection site, injection site and in Mrs. Reed's brain. Mr. Reed has a rare form of ALS that worsens more slowly and his mind has not been affected. Diana Reed would help him get in and out of bed, the shower and his wheelchair. She became more instrumental in his accounting business as his speech worsened. After her death, members of their church brought meals and did laundry, and the church accepted donations to hire help to assist Mr. Reed with his personal care. That is just one story of the tragedy that the commissioner of the FDA says will happen again if we don't act, and we believe this bill will help to prevent such a tragedy. Steroid injections last year were meant to ease the pain of hundreds of Americans and many Tennesseans, and instead it became their worst nightmare. These vials of contaminated medicine, compounded medicine, were contaminated. 64 Americans, including 16 from my state, died from the outbreak. It's a horrible way to die. When the HELP Committee held its first hearings on this tragic outbreak in November of last year, we looked at how could this possibly happen. It became clear that these contaminated vials were produced in a facility that was nothing like a traditional pharmacy, a corner drugstore, if you will. It operated more like a manufacturer, but it was unclear which regulator was in charge. Was the state in charge or was the FDA in charge? I made it clear at the beginning of the hearing that my priority was to find a way 
to clarify who is accountable for large-scale drug compounding facilities, who is on the flagpole for overseeing the safety of drugs made in these facilities. I use the example of Hyman Rickover and the nuclear navy in the 1950s. Admiral Rickover was doing something new. He was doing something dangerous. He was putting reactors, potentially dangerous, he was putting reactors on submarines and ships, uh, and no one knew quite how that was going to work. So what did he do about it? Admiral Rickover hired the captain. He interviewed the captain. He said, first, you're responsible for your ship, and second, you're responsible for the reactor. And if there's ever a problem with a reactor, your career's over. Well, Mr. President, the United States Navy has never had a death on a nuclear ship as a result of a reactor problem because everyone knew after Admiral Rickover made those decisions who is on the flagpole. There should be no confusion after this bill is passed and signed by the president who is on the flagpole for a particular facility that makes sterile drugs. We should be able to walk into any one of our 60,000 drugstores or pharmacies or to our doctors or pain clinics and not have to worry about whether the medicines we get there are safe. The bill we are voting on represents that year of work that we talked about to find a solution. Today, we have drug manufacturers on the one hand and traditional pharmacies, the corner drug store, on the other. This legislation creates a new voluntary third category, which we call outsourcing facility. If a drug store chooses to be in this category, they follow one nationwide quality standard and the FDA is responsible for all the drugs made in that facility. FDA is on the flagpole. What's the advantage of this? Well, first, it eliminates the confusion. It eliminates the finger pointing. If, heaven forbid, this should happen again, it will be clear whose fault it was, who didn't do their job of regulating. But second, it provides an option available to doctors and hospitals who, if they choose to, can choose to buy all their sterile drugs from a facility regulated by the FDA. Outsourcing facilities are subject to regular FDA inspections. The New England compounding senator that caused these problems was not inspected by the state or the FDA from 2006 to 2011. Outsourcing facilities must report the products made at the facility to the FDA. The New England senator that caused the problems was making copies of commercially available drugs, which is illegal. Outsourcing facilities must report to FDA when things go wrong with a product. Currently, large-scale compounders don't have any required reporting to FDA if they know about a problem with a product. And finally, outsourcing facilities, this new category, must clearly label their products so patients know it's compounded rather than FDA approved. Traditional pharmacy compounders will continue to be primarily regulated by the states, but for outsourcing facilities, the FDA is in charge. During our discussions, we heard a lot about drug shortages, and the senator from Iowa and I worked especially to deal with that. We tried to address it where appropriate in this legislation. We know that compounded products aren't the answer to drug shortages. We don't want count compounded products or to be the backup solution to drug shortages. We want a better answer than that. We recognize the problem, tried to address it here. Because of heroic actions of state officials with the Tennessee Department of Health, more people didn't get sick from the outbreak last fall. I don't intend to sit through another hearing where FDA can point the finger at someone else instead of taking responsibility or, cl or claim it doesn't have enough authority. And if we pass this legislation, FDA won't be able to. This legislation also establishes clear rules for outsourcing facilities, puts FDA on the flagpole for drugs made in those facilities. I hope that my colleagues will vote this afternoon to move to the bill and that shortly after that, we will be able to move to unanimously approve it as the House as the House did. Now, just one other, one other comment, Mr. President. Uh, the chairman, the senator from Iowa, 
um, as well as Senator Burr, Senator Bennett, and others, have been working for at least two years on this form of legislation we call track and trace. It's been through the vetting. I think everybody's had a chance to read it, to make a suggestion about it. There have been many changes and adjustments to make sure that it works. Here's the problem. In the United States today, we have about 4 billion prescriptions written every year. We don't have a uniform system to track and trace these, judge, these, these drugs once they leave the manufacturer, which makes it easier for counterfeits and substandard products to enter the market and puts patients at risk. The laws governing the tracking of drugs haven't been updated since 1988. In the last two years alone, there have been three cases of counterfeit of Vastin, a cancer drug being distributed in the U.S. to physicians and patients when the counterfeit did not contain any of the active <coughs> ingredient. We've seen an increase in drug theft. We've got no way of knowing even when these drugs are resold in the U.S. supply chain. In 2009, insulin stolen from a truck months earlier was sold by pharmacies and the insulin was ineffective due to proper storage. Stealing drugs has turned into a big business. And without assurance that drugs are stored under certain conditions <clears throat> and handled correctly throughout the supply chain, the drugs may not work. This legislation would set up a system over time, 10 years, where products that are stolen could be flagged as such, preventing distribution to patients. It represents a consensus on establishing a national system for all prescription drugs to have a specific serial number on the bottle. That means wholesalers, repackagers, pharmacies will be able to check the serial number on the bottle with the manufacturer to see if that number was assigned by the manufacturer. The serial number will not only help prove that it is not counterfeit, but the information can also be used to determine if anything else has been reported about that bottle, including if the product was stolen. This won't happen overnight. Creating a system that traces 4 billion prescriptions made by over 80 manufacturers on over 3,600 manufacturing lines that are dispensed to patients through a variety of ways will take some time. But the path laid out for us over a number of years will assure the U.S. drug supply chain is secure and that consumers receive drugs that work. I want to thank the senator from Iowa, as I have already, for his leadership on these two extraordinary pieces of legislation, Senator Burr and Senator Bennett on the track and trace legislation, Senator Roberts, Senator Franken worked hard on compounding legislation. Let me end where I began. The FDA commissioner challenged us, Mr. President. She said, if we don't act, this tragedy will happen again. We have an opportunity to act tonight I hope that we do. The families who were devastated by this tragedy of contaminated sterile injections that created fungal meningitis in many of our states, especially in Tennessee, expect us to act. If we do, it will be not as well advertised as the differences of opinion that we can have in the United States Senate, but it will demonstrate how when we work together over a period of a couple of years, that we can take a very big piece of complex legislation, in fact two, that affect the health and safety of every American and come to a consensus that takes a large step forward. I thank the President. I yield the floor.